is our frequent guest and someone who has been leading the charge on talking about the reality of the Ukraine conflict with sobriety, not hysteria. We have with us Colonel Douglas McGregor. How you doing, sir? Fine, David. How are you? I'm great. You know, I, I saw this new piece you had in the American Conservative. It says Washington's Carthaginian peace collides with reality. And uh, the subtext is the Biden administration refuses to tell the American people the truth. Ukraine is not winning and will not win this war. Can you give us a little uh, overview of what you're trying to communicate in this article? Oh, sure. Uh, Over the last several months, in fact, I would argue virtually from the 24th of February when the uh, Russians first intervened, the tendency in the media has been to repeat ad nauseum whatever the Ukrainian government says and treat it as the truth. And let's be frank, from the outset, uh, they've been telling everyone, well, the Ukrainians are winning, the Russians are losing, the Russians are losing tens of thousands of soldiers, they're losing hundreds of tanks and critical equipment, and the Russians can't do anything right, and the Russians are losing. Well, that has never really been true. Uh, Virtually from the beginning, the Russians went in with a fraction of the force that they had available because they assumed that we ultimately would negotiate and be interested in arranging a ceasefire and coming to some sort of agreement because their principal interest, as you know, was always to have a neutral Ukraine. This didn't happen. And uh, finally, in the summer, uh, I think the the leadership in Moscow decided we've, we've got to change our approach. We have no choice. We have to treat Ukraine as a theater of war. And that's what they've done. They have absolutely turned Ukraine into a theater of war, and they have changed their approach 180 degrees from what it was. Ukrainians have been losing hundreds of thousands of men as casualties. We estimate they've had 400,000 casualties, of which over 100,000 are dead. Now, very recently, Ursula von der Leyen, who is the president of the European Union, actually admitted that the Ukrainians had lost at least 100,000 dead. The truth is that over the last several months, the losses have been so heavy that we think it's probably closer now to about 120 to 125,000. And the second part of this, of course, is that uh, the Europeans and we, to a large extent, have run out of ammunition and equipment to send to them. We're now talking about uh, building new equipment that could be sent over and stripping out whatever we can find from many of our own units to the point where, frankly, if we had to fight a war in Central Europe, we'd be in trouble. We're down to days, maybe a couple of weeks of ammunition. The Russians have always been accused of running out of rockets, running out of missiles, running out of ammunition, and nothing could be further from the truth. They've been running out of tanks, and again, nothing could be further from the truth. The Russians now have set up a a very effective defense while they build up for massive offensive operations in December and January. And uh, those those build-ups are almost complete. We can account now, as I pointed out in the op-ed, for about 540,000 troops, 1,500 tanks, uh, another 3,000-plus armored fighting vehicles, uh, hundreds of guns, 1,000 rocket and drone uh, strike systems, uh, hundreds of fixed wing, fixed wing aircraft, and hundreds of helicopters. The bottom line is that the Russians are now going to war, and the Ukrainians are frankly on the ropes. All of their sophisticated equipment, the rocket artillery systems, what few they have left, are operated now by Americans and British contractors. They don't have the trained personnel to do anything. So. Ukraine is really in a lot of trouble, and that's why Zelensky is working very, very hard to convince everybody that we should give our last uh, full measure for Ukraine. But it's not going to work, and Ukraine is going to be destroyed. And as we've seen from the new missile strikes, the energy grid is almost completely gone. Electricity is almost totally absent. Water, food, all the amenities that make life bearable are missing, and millions of Ukrainians are now leaving Ukraine because they cannot live where they are. We should really be interested in easing the burden on the Ukrainians, and that burden will not be eased by supplying more arms that the Russians will simply destroy or capture. It it will be eased by negotiations in which 
the West has to concede territory to Russia and agree to a non-NATO status, in other words, a neutral status, for uh, Ukraine. Nobody wants to do that, so under the circumstances, Ukraine is doomed. Yeah, I'm looking at this story in Al Jazeera. U.S. and France pledge Ukraine support amid Russia's brutal war, but they've, they're they vowing to uh, hold Russia accountable for atrocities and war crimes in its invasion of Ukraine, the headline says. Yeah, yeah. what's really depressing is that uh, all of the things the Ukrainians have accused the Russians of doing are things the Ukrainians themselves have done. Ukrainian soldiers have actively posted a video of Russian prisoners of war being executed. The, the Russians have not executed any prisoners of war. Uh, quite the contrary. They, they've actually behaved remarkably well. And Putin has been absolutely insistent that uh, they not kill civilians. The problem is that they, they were so careful in the past and so anxious to avoid damaged infrastructure that people thought they were weak. Well, that's now over. They they are willing to accept collateral damage if they can destroy am, ammunition and storage points, fuel systems, uh, and and electricity. They they will do that, and that's what's happening right now. And soon, I think they'll move on to transportation infrastructure, bridges, roads, and these kinds of things to ensure that the Ukrainians cannot resupply themselves. And and right now they're they're virtually at a standstill anyway. They have no diesel. They have no fuel. What fuel they have is going into generators to heat buildings and homes. So, you know, everybody's pledging more and more and more. But the truth is, David, not much is arriving. There just isn't much to send anymore. So the, the real point is, if anybody cares about the Ukrainian people, if people want to see Ukraine as a nation state survive, we, we need to talk with the Russians. And no one seems to be willing to do that. Why? I mean, is there anybody that's, I mean, we heard, you said no one wants to talk to Russians, but what about the uh, story about uh, Milley, you know, General Milley trying to reach out and do something about peace and, and, and so forth? I mean, isn't well, there any... General well, Milley, General Milley's job is the senior advisor to the President of the United States. He has yeah. no authority to reach out to anybody. Right. And that's one of the problems that General Milley has. He seems to think he's got authority that he doesn't. What he did is that he leaked to the New York Times comments that he made to President Biden. Uh, incidentally, he leaked uh, information that he had shared with President Bush, or excuse me, President Trump when he was in office. He seems to uh, do that in the hopes that this will somehow or another elevate his position. It's the wrong thing to do, but in the course of leaking to the New York Times, apparently he leaked this information, because just as uh, President Trump had rejected his advice on one or two occasions, you have the same thing happening now with President Biden. And when he suggested that the Ukrainians had done all that they could reasonably expect it to do, and this was probably the right time to negotiate, he was told, forget it. Out of the question. We're not negotiating with the Russians. Uh, and he didn't like it, and so he decided to leak it. Well, within 24 hours, he was obviously reprimanded, and he went public and recanted everything that he had said and talked again about fighting until the last Ukrainian is dead, and we have shipped the last round of ammunition. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, I think that's where we are. And when Biden or anybody else says, well, if the Russians want to end the war, we'll talk to them, what they're really saying is that if you capitulate— if you surrender to us on our terms, which is why I use the Carthaginian peace, then uh, we'll talk to you. Well, that's absurd. You know, Russia is not going to surrender to the West. That's nonsense. Uh, on the contrary, if we push this, the war will simply escalate and it will find its way into Europe and to the United States. And that's the last thing we want. You, um, you, you know, you're mentioning the, the kind of need to talk and have a dialogue that's honest. There's another story, of course, here's one article that kind of captures it. Euractive.com says, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has come under fire for publishing and then unpublishing a video containing uh, 
what appears to be a very high estimate of killed Ukrainian military officers. Uh, the backlash came uh, when she put out a video message with an estimated 120,000 uh, Ukrainians had been killed during Russia's war. It's estimated that 20,000 civilians and more than 100,000 Ukrainian military officers have been killed so far, she put in her original version of the video. Uh, but she's getting a lot of backlash from saying that. Can you give us an insight as to why this is getting backlash? Because it contradicts the lie. <clears throat> we need to understand that uh, what's happened is that the uh, United States and British intelligence agencies have created a false narrative. And the media in both of those countries, as well as the media in Western Europe, have been given instructions to uh, repeat this narrative ad nauseum. And all of you have heard it. The Russians are losing. The Russians can't win. Uh, the Russians are incompetent. Uh, NATO uh, will be victorious. The Ukrainians will win, and on and on and on. This is a big lie. This has been a lie from day one. And Ursula von der Leyen, quite, I guess, unconsciously spoke the truth. Uh, she didn't say 100,000 officers. She said 100,000 Ukrainian troops. And she said 20,000 civilians. Well, that may well be true, but now it's over 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers. It's closer to 120,000 Ukrainian soldiers plus probably 20,000 civilians. Uh, and we're going to see more civilian deaths because it's a war zone. And that war zone is, is not going to improve. It's going to become much more lethal. Instead of telling people the truth, which would obviously embarrass President Biden and all of his supporters on the Hill, as well as the current and previous British prime ministers and British parliament, who all are uh, posturing as moralizing globalists, trying to tell us all how bad and evil we are, uh, as a result, they're not going to release the truth. So she's been told to shut up, back off, and, and do what she's told, just as General Milley was. But the truth is, what Milley said was accurate, and the truth is that what von der Leyen said was accurate. The Russians aren't losing. They've lost comparatively few troops compared to the Ukrainians. Their exchange rate right now is about one Russian for every eight Ukrainian dead. That's not a good exchange rate if you're, if you're going to argue that you're winning the war. That's an exchange rate for someone who is definitely losing. I see. You know, there's another story that's connected to this fallout from this conflict. Uh, BusinessInsider.com says Russia is on track to ship its highest amount of oil products since the war as Europe struggles uh -huh. to wean itself off Russian energy supplies. It goes on to, you know, in the piece it talks about how Russia is still Europe's largest single refined oil product supplier. Um, and it says Russian diesel-type shipments to Europe this month are about 50% of what Europe purchased overall, meaning the continent remains heavily reliant on Moscow ahead of the EU's ban on Russian oil products in February. Well, this is also confirmation of something else that I've been saying and others who do not subscribe to this false narrative, and that is that Russia has not been harmed by sanctions. The people that have been harmed the most by sanctions are our allies in Europe and ourselves. I mean, stop and consider the plight of farmers in Europe and the United States and around the world who don't ac have access to fertilizer. The overwhelming majority of the fertilizer is supplied to the world by Russia and Belarusia and, to a lesser extent, Ukraine. The same thing is true for wheat and a whole range of other products. The, the bottom line is that Russia has actually thrived. It's only the top 10 or 15 percent of the Russian population that uh, is not getting some of the exquisite products that come out of Italy, France, and the United States. I'm talking about things like uh, perfume or leather bags or some other thing. You know, the, the things that are uh, discretionary items, not things that you need to survive. But the Russian population as a whole, its standard of living is as good as it was when this began. And uh, the Russians have adjusted, and they have found other markets for their fuel for their energy, for their timber, for their minerals, for everything. So this whole thing from the beginning was a dumb idea because the underlying assumption was that we could somehow or another isolate Russia from the rest of the world. That's absurd. It was never possible.
And the Russians clearly were not prepared for a, a major war, but now they are. And as a result, they're going to build forces in the future that are even more capable and more powerful than what we saw 30 or 40 years ago. And that's the, the cruelest aspect of this whole thing. The very thing that we said we were going to try to do, which was to weaken Russia by forcing it to fight in Ukraine at the expense of Ukraine, has failed. And what instead we are going to see is a much stronger and more capable Russia than existed at the beginning of this process. I see. And and when when you see that this um, this this tenor seems to never change, I mean, how does this going to come to head? We were we were hoping that perhaps there would be a cooling off and there would be a kind of, uh, like you said, a compromise in, in terms of trying to resolve this conflict so the bloodshed wouldn't continue. But it doesn't seem to be that that's uh, on the mind of those uh, running the show in D.C., uh, is this well clearly if clearly if you're a Russian David uh, you know what are you going to agree to at this point I mean we're offering them a Carthaginian peace yeah. you are going to withdraw from all Ukrainian territory none of your demands or wishes will be met and Ukraine will join NATO well that's essentially saying if you're willing to show up on the battleship Missouri tomorrow morning in uh, the Baltic Sea and surrender to us we're happy to talk to you well that's absurd so it's crazy. So there's not going to be any arrangement at this stage. What instead is going to happen is the Russians are going to complete the task of annihilating the Ukrainian armed forces, and I suspect they will destroy this government. I'd be very surprised if the Ukrainian leadership survives the next two or three months. Uh, and the outcome is going to be defeat. Defeat for Ukraine, and we and our partners in, in Europe are going to look ridiculous. Now, there is one possibility, and that is that the Europeans, particularly the Germans, wake up to reality, figure out that they've been lied to about everything, and they suddenly say, that's it, we've had it, we're out. And when that happens, or if that happens, the whole thing collapses in the West. But right now, we're just on the path to certain defeat. And no one wants to admit that. And so the argument is, well, we won't be defeated. We'll just keep sending in more equipment, sending in more cash, try to find more mercenaries that will go over there and man equipment and fight for the Ukrainians. I don't see that as a winning proposition. I think time is on Russia's side, not on ours. And the Russians live there. We don't. The real, real issue here is that Americans have got to start paying attention to reality. We have no business in involving ourselves in wars five or 6,000 miles from our country. Certainly not unless there is something at, at stake for us. And in this case, there's nothing at stake for us. The only real interest we ever had was in peace. And what we're having and what we're dealing with right now is war that we didn't want and didn't need. It's harming everyone. Do you, do you see this as the end of the post World War II era of, of the, the world, this seems like it seems like this conflict could be the kind of conclusion of or a, you know, something different's gonna happen whatever whichever way this goes. That's gonna be kind of different. Well, David from... David, the tr the truth is that this post World War II order began collapsing the mo moment the Soviet Union vanished. Yeah. Once the Soviet uh, Union and and the uh, supporting Warsaw Pact system all collapsed and fell apart. That was the beginning of the end of the post-World War order. Now what's happened is that since we clung tenaciously to the past and refused to let anything go, we've been trying for the last 30 years to effectively freeze uh, the international system in a way that we see as beneficial to us. Well, it may be beneficial to us in some ways, but it's not beneficial to the rest of the world. The Russians are simply the first ones to stand up and say, that's enough. No more. We're not prepared to be exploited by you financially. We're not prepared to turn our country over to you to be dismembered and destroyed. And we've watched what you've done in other countries. We're not going to let you do that to us. And by the way, the Chinese, the Indians, and dozens of other countries on, on the planet have reached the same conclusion, which is why when you look at this war, the only people that have been interested in supporting us at all are really our allies in Western Europe. 
and some in Eastern Europe, but not everybody. And once you move out of Europe, you begin to see that the vast majority of countries are either disinterested or actively support Russia. So, you know, I, it doesn't seem like the people in uh, D.C. power circles don't seem to really uh, be worried at all about the repercussions of what they're doing there in this region. I mean, let me let me give you an example. This might pivot to something that you don't want to talk about, but it is something that the establishment is talking about. The Hill has a story saying NASA chief Bill Nelson, latest official to suggest UFOs have otherworldly origins. And I'm looking at this story because you're talking about the repercussions of this Ukraine conflict, but it's got former CIA director John Brennan speculated that these UFO objects encountering the Navy are constitute a, could constitute a different form of life. CIA, former CIA director James Woolsey, longtime UFO skeptic, says this could be something new. John Ratcliffe, Trump's former national intelligence guy, why are they talking about this instead of talking about the Ukraine conflict? Uh, well, first of all, it, it's probably a lot easier to talk about UFOs than it is to talk about the debacle in Ukraine. And as things get worse in Ukraine, and it becomes more and more obvious that Russia has achieved its aims and is victorious, we'll change the subject and try to divert everybody's attention into something else. That's usually what we do, David. We did that after Vietnam. We did that after Iraq. Uh, we did that after Afghanistan. Suddenly, it's over. We walk away. Colonel Douglas McGregor, always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, David. Bye-bye. We'll be right back after this. Stay tuned. Hope you're doing well. If you want to call in to weigh in on some of the things that Colonel Doug. 